Having talked about the right to self-determination, I now want to move on to talk about minority rights and the rights of indigenous people specifically. Now, from the outset, I want to be clear that they are certainly not one and the same, although they do share some similarities to which I'll get in a second. I will briefly talk about the rights of minorities, but will quite quickly move on to address the rights of indigenous peoples, because in my view, as a still evolving area of international human rights law, where there's a lot of criticism, a lot of debate, it is a very good illustration of what is at stake when we talk about group rights, particularly at this day and age. So what then is a minority and what are minority rights? Now, I've already given some examples of a minority in the previous clip, but you can obviously think of many other examples, such as the Uyghurs in China, the Frisian people in the Netherlands, or indeed the French-speaking community in Quebec in Canada. The latter in particular has played an important role in international law because it was actually a very famous decision of the Canadian Supreme Court relating to the status of Quebec and the French-speaking community that established the differentiation between internal and external self-determination that reaffirmed this or put this on the map for international law and international human rights law specifically. The difference between a people and a minority then is also quite clear. So a minority, obviously we are often confronted with a sort of people, but they are actually numerically inferior to the rest of the population in a country, giving them this minority status. The concept of minority usually relates to religious, linguistic and ethnic minorities, as long as they identify as such. So this subjective element is an important part, once again, of the definition, just as it was for the concept of peoples. And what's important to note here is that in the ICCPR, we find even some more additional protection next to the notion of self-determination. So indeed, in Article 27, it is guaranteed that in those states in which ethnic, religious or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right in community with the other members of the group to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, or to use their own language. What's important to note here is that this is actually an individual right, not a group right. So it is the right that an individual holds as a member of a community to indeed enjoy the culture, religious practices. And as you can imagine, if an individual member of a minority manages to be successful in their claim, for example, before the Human Rights Committee, that of course will have a much larger, more widespread effect on the situation within the community as a whole. Moving on to the rights of indigenous peoples, obviously they also constitute a minority in the states in which they are being claimed. Now, there is something distinct to the plea of indigenous peoples, and it's not so much only that often or usually they can claim to have been there prior in time to the majority, but it also has something to do with the specific rights that are often at stake. So indigenous communities have historically been struggling with, for example, expropriation of their lands, the suppression of their culture and their traditions. And it is indeed quite remarkable how the huge diversity of indigenous peoples that exist around the world in all continents have been able to come together under this umbrella term. It is indeed their struggle and their plea that unites them as a group. The history of the rights of indigenous peoples is obviously much more complicated and much more extensive than I can summarize in this one short clip, but I do want to draw your attention to two aspects specifically. The first one is the role of the American Convention on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which particularly in the end of the 1990s, early 2000s, has been used by indigenous communities to claim their rights vis-a-vis -vis state parties. And there are a number of interesting cases here that concern in particular, not only, but in particular, Article 21 of the American Convention on Human Rights, which establishes that everyone has the right to the use and enjoyment of his or her property. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights used this Article 21, amongst others, in order to come to a number of landmark decisions that I can only very briefly in one sentence summarize here. But amongst others, it reaffirmed the, and recognized the existence of communal property in the Avastini case. It recognized that the enjoyment of this ancestral communal property is actually part of realizing your cultural identity, and that was in the Yake Asa case. It also confirmed that free, prior, and informed consent is necessary according to custom in order to get indigenous peoples to, for example, agree to give, away, give up their land. That's the Saramaka case. And in the Savaya Maxa case, it also affirmed that there is a right to compensation, including a right to get equally 
um, qualitative lens. So the recognition of communal property in particular and all the things that it entails as a collective right has been really one of the main contributions of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It's the indigenous peoples who used the court, mobilized the court, and were able to get it to adopt a very broad definition to what was initially envisaged to be a individual right. And here we can see how the human rights system, even if initially perhaps not accommodating, it gradually, with the help of institutions, can evolve to a more inclusive one. And it is the mobilization of indigenous peoples that, in this particular case at least, has been driving this development. The second element to be mentioned in this brief introduction is the 2007 UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is, by many regard, as a watershed moment for the rights of indigenous peoples, because previously they were not recognized in the UN system, or at least not very extensively recognized. The declaration includes a number of rights, many of which you would expect to see in such an instrument, but it also includes those important rights that have been important to indigenous peoples, such as, for example, land rights. That being said, the declaration has not been without its critics, who make very strong points including, for example, regarding the application of the principle of self-determination, which is explicitly limited in Article 4 to matters relating to internal and local affairs. So this is the kind of internal self-determination that we have been talking about, and that indeed does subject indigenous peoples to still continuing authority by states that have often been oppressive in the past. And the second criticism relates to an article further down the instrument, namely Article 46, Paragraph 2, in which it is stated that in the exercise of the rights enunciated in the present declaration, human rights and fundamental freedoms of all shall be respected, and the provision goes on. Now, this might seem harmless, but there have been authors who have claimed that this is in fact a so-called repugnancy clause, in the sense that if indeed the practices of indigenous peoples, if the way they govern themselves is not appropriate to a essentially Western human rights framework, then well, uh, we do come to prefer the individualist human rights framework. These points are very justified and the conversations obviously still ongoing. And in each and every specific case, they might turn out the one way or the other. That being said, it's interesting to see which four countries voted against the UN Declaration when it was therefore a vote in the General Assembly. It's the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Four countries with large indigenous populations, which indeed are worried about the rights that this may give to these peoples. And it's often in this kind of rejection that we actually show the power, to, or at least the promise, of an instrument. Much more could be said about this fascinating topic, but I will leave it at that and look forward to discussing these topics with you in class.